Today, I'm gonna to talk about some interesting ways that manufacturing companies can trick people when you're reading nutritional facts or on the label. Now, I'm not gonna talk about the front of the packaging where they'll use things like uh, farm fresh or free range or natural. I'm primarily gonna talk about what's on the back of the label. There's a lot of things on this label, but we're gonna do a deep dive into real specific important points that you need to know about. The first thing is the serving size. Realize that when you're looking at the different values, especially total carbohydrates, net carbs, sugars, realize that those figures are per serving size, not the whole container. So you really have to look at what is in a serving size, okay? What is in the whole container? How many serving sizes are you gonna consume in that meal? And then multiply that times the total net carb. Because if you don't, you can very easily be misled because some of these products have like 33 serving size and you might eat the whole box of something and think you're okay when you're not really okay. All right, the next point is regarding trans fats. That's under total fats at the top. And here's the standard. If you have trans fats of less than a half of a gram, which is less than 500 milligrams, you can make your trans fats as zero. So remember the serving size. If your serving size is 30, for example, and there is like 499 milligrams of trans fats per serving size, and you eat the whole box, guess what? You're getting a lot of trans fats without knowing it. So how do you know you have trans fats? Well, you go to the bottom part where it says ingredients and you look for two words. One is hydrogenated and the other is partially hydrogenated. If it has either one of those two words, then you know there's trans fats in this product. All right, the next part I'm gonna talk about is the most important part of this video. And it's really um, understanding carbohydrates and what that means, okay? So you have the total carbohydrates. And then underneath that, you have dietary fiber. And underneath that, you have total sugars. And then you're also supposed to see the added sugars. And then under that, you may see sugar alcohols. So sugar alcohols are sweeteners that don't apparently increase insulin too much. So they are not classified under sugars. They're instead classified as sugar alcohols. Now, let me just switch over to net carbs. What is a net carb? A net carb is you take the total carb and you minus the fiber. That will give you this net carb. And that's basically what you're gonna be using to be in keto. In other words, to be in keto, the net carb needs to be below 50 grams per day. Now, this might sound pretty easy to understand and, and follow and implement, but there's a couple tricks that manufactured companies use um, to make these values look more favorable. Let's talk about the first trick. Okay, maltodextrin. Maltodextrin is mostly a polysaccharide. What is a polysaccharide? That's a starch, okay? And so starch is a series of sugars that are attached together. And so starch is not classified under sugars. It's under total carbohydrate. And the way this is classified is this. If you have a polysaccharide, okay, a starch, you don't have to put it under sugars. If it's a disaccharide, which is two connecting sugars, or a monosaccharide, which is one sugar like glucose, it needs to be classified under sugars. But because maltodextrin is classified as a polysaccharide, it doesn't have to be listed under sugars, despite acting like a sugar, okay? Because if you look at the glycemic index, maltodextrin is like way, way higher than sugar. It's higher than glucose. Maltodextrin is between 106 and 136. It's way the heck up there. Now that's because it gets absorbed in the stomach a lot faster than sugar. And that's probably because it's far from being natural. The way that they make maltodextrin is using all sorts of chemical processes that break down cornstarch. Now it could also be tapioca. It can also be wheat. It could also be potato, rice, but it's usually cornstarch. And then they heat it under high pressures using certain chemicals and they come out with this maltodextrin. And maltodextrin is in so many products. And if maltodextrin does have some disaccharide or monosaccharide, that is supposed to be in the sugars. However, you can go to Amazon right now 
and bimaltodextrin and look at the back of the label, you'll see that it has no sugar. It's all carbohydrate. That means it's all starch. And the problem with that is that a lot of times they'll advertise this product with less than one gram of sugar or, or no sugar, but it has a lot of carbohydrate that acts like sugar, even worse than sugar. And the other interesting thing is maltodextrin many times is not used to sweeten something. It's used as a flow agent to help dry out certain extracts, even like stevia, for example. And if that per serving size is less than a half of a gram of maltodextrin, that can be considered a zero. So in other words, you could be getting maltodextrin without even knowing you're getting it. If it's less than 500 milligrams per serving size. Now, everything that I talked about maltodextrin, that also applies to dextrin because dextrin is also a polysaccharide, a starch that can act like sugar, but it's not classified as a sugar. It's a starch under the total carbs. So you just wanna avoid any products with maltodextrin or dextrin. Now, to make things even more complex, you also have something called resistant maltodextrin, okay? Now this is classified as a fiber. In other words, manufacturing companies have found a way to turn this polysaccharide, this starch, maltodextrin, into a fiber chemically. So it's an isolated, chemically made, they call it functional fiber. And now they're positioning functional fibers as a health benefiting um, ingredient. And so you have uh, soluble corn fiber, which basically is resistant maltodextrin, tapioca fiber, which is resistant maltodextrin. These are all fibers and not classified under sugars, and they are deducted from the total carbohydrate. So you can have a lot of these new fibers in your ingredient that basically are not even calculated in this equation because they're deducted out with the fiber. Now, the question is, do they affect your blood sugars? Well, there's studies that say that they might, but the problem is these new functional fibers are new to our diet, and a lot of people are having a lot of digestive problems, inflammation, bloating, gas, diarrhea. And so the jury is still out. And personally, I would stick with fiber that comes from real food, like vegetables. There is a big difference between an isolated synthesized fiber and fiber that comes from nature with all the other factors that work synergistically. And just think about the source of these fibers, like wheat, for example, or corn or potato or rice or tapioca. And I'm not gonna even get into whether they're GMO or not at this, this point. All right, so that's the fiber part. Let's touch on the sugar alcohols for a second. Remember I told you that sugar alcohols can also be deducted just like fiber from total carbs to get your net carbs? Well, there are certain sugar alcohols that definitely will spike your blood sugars and create a problem. And the big one is maltitol, but you also have sorbitol and mannitol. Now, xylitol can affect the blood sugars to some degree, um, but not as much as the other ones. The only sugar alcohol that I know that doesn't affect your blood sugars is erythritol. So even though these sugar alcohols are deducted from the total carbohydrates, giving you the net carb, your blood sugars can still be affected. And on top of that, let's say some of this fiber or functional fiber um, resistant starch that you consume, it's creating a lot of digestive issues. Well, the stress in your digestive system could potentially elevate your blood sugars. Why? Because of all the inflammation that's created. Now, one side note, when, when you bake things that are keto-friendly using um, erythritol, they usually add stevia or monk fruit, okay? In addition, they're also adding maltodextrin to that. So if you're gonna get a sweetener, make sure you get the ones that don't have the maltodextrin or dextrin. Maltodextrin many times is not even that sweet, but it's there as a filler. It gives you the mouthfeel. It gives you a certain texture, uh, very similar to fat, but it sure acts like a carbohydrate. So we're looking at this label and we're trying to get this net carb. It's very important to understand the type of carb that's in this product, okay? Because if we're gonna try to do the healthy version of keto, we want healthy ingredients. And so that number, um, 50 grams net carb, should be 
quality, nutrient-dense carbohydrates. And all these resistant starches just don't have the nutrient values um, compared to regular real food. Now, another way that manufacturing companies trick people is with this whole grains, right? I mean, just take a look in the grocery store, all these cereals. And I'm talking about the worst cereals that you could eat, you know, filled with sugars. At the right at the top, it says whole grain. And of course, people think that that gives some benefit. But what about all the other things that are added to the whole grain, right? I mean, to make it taste good. Of course, you got sugars, chemicals, preservatives, not to mention the whole grain is ground into flour. And who knows how long it's been oxidized or sitting on some shelf before it's turned into some product. I mean, these delicate vitamins, these fat-soluble vitamins in grains are highly susceptible to oxygen and heat, and they can go rancid really fast. And then when they're put into a product and they sit on the shelf for a period of time, you're consuming a product that has very, very low levels of nutrients. So just because something says 100% whole grains doesn't mean they're 100% healthy. Now, the other point I wanna bring up is that when you look at some of these keto-friendly products, they actually put in there like wheat gluten, right? Well, yeah, that's a protein, but so many people have a gluten intolerance and they're gonna have a lot of digestive issues from that type of protein. And then you have soy protein isolates, probably one of the lowest quality sources of protein that you can get is soy protein isolates. It's just not a natural thing that we're supposed to eat. Another point about sweeteners, even keto friendly foods have uh, sugar in them, but they will have low amounts of sugar. And many times that sugar is not even cane sugar, it's beet sugar. And 95% of all beet sugar is GMO. So it has traces glyphosate, which is the herbicide they spray when you have GMO products. Now the same thing with wheat. Wheat is not GMO, but they still sometimes spray it with glyphosate. And I wanna to touch on non-GMO for a second. It does not mean genetically modified organism free. It's listed as non-GMO project verified. So basically they go through a series of standards that they must meet. They don't necessarily test them to see if there's actually GMO organisms or byproducts in the product. It's a checklist that they follow, which lowers the risk of having GMO foods in that product. So non-GMO project verified does not mean absolutely 100% free of GMOs. And the last point I wanna bring up is this point about antibiotics. When a product says no antibiotics, it doesn't mean that there hasn't been antibiotics used. You just can't use antibiotics past the second day of life. But as far as eggs go, if an egg has not been hatched yet, or let's say it's been hatched and that chick is alive for one day and it's given antibiotics, but then from the second day on, no antibiotics, it could be classified as no antibiotics, even though it was given antibiotics on the first day. Now, if something is classified as no growth promoting antibiotics, that doesn't mean they're not using antibiotics. They're just using antibiotics for different purposes not necessarily for growing the chicken, but for other reasons, like the chicken is sick. And when they say no medically important antibiotics, that means that they're not using antibiotics that are used for humans, but they can use other types of antibiotics that are not for humans, but for animals. So I just wanted to talk about and list uh, several tricks that manufacturing companies use to get you to buy their products. And I really highly suggest you start reading labels right now and apply this information. Now, I think the best next video for you to watch would be the one on organic food. Check it out. I put it right here.